All right, thanks for coming, guys. We're going to get started. Sorry for the delay. We got uh, snafu with the camera. Um, and I will get a mic just as soon as they uh, fetch a cable for it. I'm told. All right, uh, so this talks about the future of Boost Proto. Thanks for coming. My name is Eric Biedler. I've been a Boost developer for about uh, a decade now. And uh, uh, I started Boost uh, quite a while back. Um, uh, I started Proto a while back, and it's um, well, uh, a library for building domain-specific languages in C++, and it's built on expression templates. Uh, and it'll all make more sense once we get to the first example. Uh, so this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to run through uh, one basic example. Uh, presenting Proto as if it were a new library. You know so what, we'll, we'll be moving in, in 15 minutes. Yeah. We'll work on battery for that one. We're going to be talking about uh, front ends and back ends, and grammars and transformations, and user defined expressions. And hopefully, we'll have time at the end to run through uh, some, uh, some ways in which C11 has, has really made Proto v5 uh, much better. Um, and how it also affects any kind of library design. So, I'm going to be running through this pretty quick. Yeah? Does this have any no. Repeat the question, please. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, does this mean that there is a pre C11 version 5? No, there isn't. This is going to require C11. In fact, it requires a very compliant C11 compiler, by which I mean client compiled from drunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It uh, heavily uses one feature that only went into Clang uh, about a month ago. That being inherited constructors. Oh, okay. Inherited constructors. Did you try TCC 4A? I haven't tried yet because I'd have to build TCC. Does the platform have a That's released with inherited constructors. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to go fast, and if you have any questions, just shout them out. Okay. Uh, can everybody see this okay, or is the light uh, too bright? It's okay? Yeah. All right, great. And you can hear me because you know. I think the light's too bright, personally. Yeah? If it could be turned off, it would be great. I don't know how to do that. I think that makes it closest to switch there. This one? Probably. Oh. Is that better? Oh, awesome. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Terrific. So we're going to be running through an example of a domain specific language from Boost Assign, and it's called MapList of. And here's what it looks like. If you, if you uh, include a uh, list of, you can initialize a std map with an expression like this. Uh, anybody uh, uh, use Boost Design? Familiar with this? OK, great. Um, so this is what we're going to be building today uh, using Boost Proto. Uh, and it's a very simple domain-specific language. Uh, it has exactly one token and one operator. That's the function call operator. But even for a small DSL like that, Proto is pretty useful. So let's just look at this one line of code. What can you say about map list of if this line of code compiles? Just go ahead and shout it out. Requirements. Okay, function or a type. The what? It's either a function or a type. Oh, Why? Object. Could it be or a type? Object. It's either a function or a type? Yeah, it's an object, right? Or, or it's a function, right? Or it's a it recursively returns itself. Well, it returns something, right. yeah. something uh, that also has uh, a function invocation operator. Yeah. Why couldn't it be a type? Map list of can't be a type. It has to be an object. Why can't, why, it, why can't it be a constructor type one and two to construct the object of type map list of? Oh, it could be uh, the type of an object to construct. That's correct. However, the reason it can't be in this case is because uh, it needs to deduce these types and remember uh, what this type is. So this has to be a function that returns something that is parameterized on int and int. So obviously what you do is capture boost and int of the second one, you know, now you know the type. <laughs> so yeah, you could be, it could be implemented with boost and int. Let's not get crazy here, people. Come on. <laughs> Uh, so, so how do you uh, build one of these things? All right. 
you're going to uh, define a proto terminal. So here we say map list of is a proto terminal, and the syntax for this is, is a little uh, uh, interesting. Proto expert, and then it's parameterized on a very strange looking thing. I call this an expression descriptor. It's a function type that describes what kind of expression you're building. This is a tag type, and this is the type of the thing that's being contained within the expression. So you can think of proto expert as a tagged tuple. Tag being the kind of node it is, and the uh, tuple elements being uh, either the children, or in the case of uh, proto expert, it would be the terminal that's stored within, the value stored within the terminal. Uh, so for non-terminals, uh, you're going to have other expressions here. So think of a, a tuple of tuples of tuples, and that's how we build our tree-like data structure. So this code compiles and runs and does absolutely nothing. Uh, now this is Boost Proto because it defines all the operators for you to make sure that this compiles. That is, Proto Expert has a function call operator, captures its arguments, returns it in a new proto expression, and that's going to be a terminal, uh, a function call proto expression that will store its children. So that's pretty great. We didn't have to write any templates. We didn't have to define any operator overloads. It just works. Okay? This is a you know, graphic of the kind of tree that we build. So this builds a tree that looks something like this. Here is our seed terminal. That would be map list of. You invoke it with one and two, and you get a function node. You invoke that with two and three, and you get another function node, and et cetera. You build up a tree-like data structure like this. Any questions about that? No? OK. OK. Uh, you can visualize them using Proto uh, with a, a function. Sorry, I already covered it up, so you can't see it. You can pass one of these things to a function called display expert that will just uh, pretty print it out to uh, the standard output. And you get something that looks like this. So here you can see the tree structure. You can see here we have terminals. Here we have function nodes. You can see the types of the terminals, ints and map list of. And you can see what's stored by const reference and what's stored by value. Okay. Why did you draw the arrows the other way and you explain the tree? Why did I draw the arrows the other way? Uh, this is like contains or owns. So this function node is going to own this function node, which owns, etc. That's the only reason. Oh, okay. So um, is, it, is it a new feature that it uh, shows you the types and, and whether they're stored by reference or not? Uh, clearly, you've used Proto before, uh, and it doesn't do that. This is a really nice feature to help me debug stuff. So I added it, and I will eventually backport that feature. OK. Next, I'm going to be talking about validating expression trees. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, here, you can write a crazy expression like this, and it actually compiles, and the compiler doesn't you know, complain at all. It compiles because by default with Proto, you get every operator uh, in the zoo of operators that C++ has. Yeah, Dave? It might be too early to answer this question, but I was asking it in my head ten minutes ago. Uh, Proto expert is a Okay, yeah, the question is, was there a reason I, I chose for uh, promiscuous operators instead of um, opt-in? Um, I find that uh, it makes it uh, very easy uh, to rapidly get a DSL up and running uh, when all the operators are just there and you can play with them. It's really nice. Uh, and I do give you a very easy way uh, to specify which operators to disable uh, for expressions that you're interested in. So. It's just a choice of default. Um, this is for rapid prototyping. So uh, actually, now that I think of it, you wouldn't have that nice behavior of sort of being a lambda library out of the box if you, if you didn't have that promiscuous behavior, right? Right, yeah. 
So uh, you wouldn't be able to write the lambda library very easily, which actually needs all the operators um, if it didn't have that behavior, which is true. Okay. So what do we do about this? We'd like to be able to detect when somebody has passed us an invalid expression and report it, you know, in a sane way, as opposed to just giving them, like, mountains of compiler spew. Okay. So describe in words what makes this a valid map list of tree. Anybody? If you were to write the grammar, you know, of map list of expressions, what would it look like? Every node has three children, either functions or integers. Okay. You can make it, uh, you can tighten it up just a little bit. Yeah, okay. So there, there are two types of valid map list of expressions. One is a function type with a seed and two terminals, or a function type with a valid map list of expression and two terminals. Or you can shorten it and say, you know, is seed by itself a valid map list of expression? Maybe you want to initialize a, a map with nothing. Um, so, yeah, okay, you could say like, this is a valid map list of tree in and of itself, or function types with those two, which is how we do this. Map list of terminal or a ternary function node, exactly what you said. So let's talk about how you say this in Proto. In Proto, you define grammars, just like when you're defining a compiler. Okay? And you use, uh, you use Proto def to define things in Proto. So we say a valid map list of tree, we call it map list of, we say proto def, and we're going to match some things. Now notice already, using function types here again. Okay. Proto uses function types extensively uh, as a, like a shorthand for compile time DSL building. Okay. Map list of terminal or proto terminal that contains map list of. This is the same function type that we used when we define the map list of terminal itself. So before it was an expression descriptor, now it's an expression pattern. Matches expressions of that type. Okay? Or a ternary function node with the following children. So this is the tag type that denotes functions. And then the first child happens to be map list of, which is what we're defining. So this is recursive. Okay. And then two terminals of arbitrary type and underscore is a wild card that matches anything. Okay, everybody with me? I argue that this map list of captures precisely the grammar of our map list of domain specific language. You got it? Okay. Cool. So what do you do with map list of? Well, you can check actual expressions to find out whether they match or not. Proto assert matches is uh, just a simple macro wrapper around, say, a decal type and uh, the map list of, and there's a meta function in Proto called Proto matches. So you pass it two types, an expression type and a grammar. It returns a compile time Boolean whether the uh, expression matched the grammar or not. Okay? And you could also verify that this one does not match our grammar. And of course, they're evaluated at compile time. Yeah, question? No, no, it doesn't. So uh, does uh, this grammar, uh, so really you want like all of the key types to, to be the same. They could be anything, but they all need to be the same. Uh, no, this doesn't capture that. That would actually be uh, kind of a difficult grammar to write. Alistair. Exactly, yeah. 
Exactly. So what Alistair points out, you don't actually want them to be all the same type. You just want them to be convertible to the correct type. Yeah. Which you could also write the grammar to enforce that, I think. You need to, yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I say a thing. I, I think you'd need to know in advance what type the key is, which you don't know when you're building the expression. Okay. Yeah. Underscore at the end of the map list of terminal, what's that? Uh, this was the type of the uh, map list of guy. Let's see if I can go back to where I define it. So here, we define an empty struct, map list yeah, yeah, of, okay. and then here's like it's terminal of that type. Okay. Good question. Thanks. Okay, so that's great. Uh, we can build expressions. Uh, we can validate them against a grammar that we've defined, but now we need to actually do something with them. So uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be turning this into a std map. So describe in words how you would build a std map, like by traversing this tree. Anyone? Uh, just uh, basically recurse, and at each node in the tree, grab the two terminals and use them as key and value pair to uh, insert them into the map. Alistair. It's important we start with the least most, furthest one, because if we've got a unique key, the order the elements are inserted is going to be significant. Oh, that's actually a really good point, and I didn't think about it. Alistair says um, it actually matters whether you do uh, 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 depth first, back up, or start at the top and work down because uh, if you have duplicate key entries, you know, right, one might be thrown away or the other one might be thrown away. Never thought of that. Good point. Thanks. Okay, so we pretty much nailed it. Uh, for map list of terminals, do nothing. Otherwise, recurse on the zeroth child, the function node, and insert into the map the first and second children as you go. Okay. Does this sound a little bit like the description that we gave earlier for what a valid map list of tree is. This should seem kind of evocative, right? I'm, I'm hoping you're evoked. Because um, my point is, oftentimes the things that you want to do with an expression have an awful lot to do with uh, the grammar of valid expressions in that domain. And in fact, we can use the grammar that we defined to drive an algorithm. And anyone who's written a compiler knows this and used a compiler construction toolkit like Antler or Spirit. The way you define a grammar like that, or, or a compiler like that, is you write the grammar, and then in the grammar you stick what are called semantic actions. When this pattern match, when this production matches, do this thing. When this matches, do this other thing. And that's basically all that Proto is. It's a compiler construction toolkit for domain-specific languages in C++. Okay. So, let's do that. Let's take our grammar and let's decorate it with actions that actually do this thing. So let's start with terminals. That's a pretty easy case because for terminals we do nothing. And in Proto, we write that as void nothing. Uh, like construct void and return it. Okay. This is a little language that's built using function types for defining actions. And we use this, Proto case, to associate an action with a grammar rule. And we're going to have bunches of case statements kind of like, like a switch statement or if you can think of like Haskell, if you know Haskell and you're defining, you know, pattern matching, you know. Okay. Questions about this one? No? All right. Now we're going back and we're going to look at the other case, proto function. Now we've got to do two things. We've got to recurse on this guy and then we've got to insert into the map the first and second children. So let's take a, take a look at recursing on the zeroth child. Okay. Remember, we're defining map list of. And we want to recurse, that is, 
call the map list of action on itself on the first child of whatever was matched over here. So we say that like this. And let's take a closer look at that guy because it's a little weird. Okay. We're using function types to represent function invocations. Think of this as something, as standing in for the current expression. That is the function node. Child zero is going to return the zeroth child of that thing. It's almost like, it looks like we're calling child zero, a child zero function. That's kind of what we're doing. All right. And now pass the, that zeroth child to map list of and evaluate it. Okay. So all actions operate on the current node by default. So you don't have to say child zero of the current expression. The current expression is assumed, so you can kind of leave it off. Just a shorthand means exactly the same thing. Save some typing. Okay. So here's what we have so far. And now we want to insert into the map the first and second children. And, and here's where it gets a little interesting because now we've write, we need to write some custom code to get it to do this. So how do we do that? Well, let's just imagine for a time that there's something called map insert that'll do it for us. Well, we, we need to insert into something a map. Okay, Proto doesn't know about our map, so we have to pass it in as a separate parameter when we're calling map list of. So, Proto data, think of this as, you know, if the argument is the first argument, if the expression is the first argument, then we can pass map as a second argument. And data will retrie retrieve the second argument of whatever we've passed in. Think of it as a placeholder. If if underscore, here, if underscore returns the first argument, you can think of it as uh, like underscore one in boost bind, and data is like underscore two. It returns the second argument. All right. And then proto value of the first child and proto value of the second child. That's going to be our actual terminals. Okay, so let's back up. What is proto, in, what's map insert? Well, it's an, it's an action that you've defined yourself. And this is what, that's really simple, right? That's just a function object. It's, an op, it's a class, it's got the overloaded function call operator, takes three arguments, the map and the two values, the key and the value, and it does the map insert. I know that's a lot. So take a second and see if you have any questions. Alistair. Why are you passing key and value by value rather than doing perfect forwarding? For instance, I couldn't insert a unique pointer into this map. Yeah, because it wouldn't fit on the slide. So the question is, uh, why am I passing key and value uh, by value instead of uh, by perfect forwarding? And yeah, I'm taking shortcuts. Yeah, question. Don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, the question is, so um, you had to do, you had to jump through a, a few more hoops in uh, the old version of Proto. Uh, in particular, like this needed to be uh, callable. You needed to tell Proto that it was a, a callable thing. Uh, but you don't need to do that anymore. And Proto figures it out. Thanks uh, to C++11. And you don't require the result type either. So you don't have to follow the TR1 protocol. Nobody needs to follow the TR. Please stop following the TR1 protocol for all the function objects that you write. Yeah. Uh, why don't you those, uh, uh, so why don't you need to tell Proto that it's callable? Um, because of, sort of because of decal type. It's because of uh, extended sphene for expressions. So uh, Proto needs to figure out, like, all right, am I constructing an object or am I calling a function? For the people who don't know what we're talking about, um, you can use function types uh, to define actions in a different way in Proto, that is, as pseudo-constructor calls. 
So when you see like map insert with three parameters, there's a question. Am I constructing a map insert object with, you know, from three arguments? Or am I calling a map insert function with three arguments? So what Proto does is it tries both, throws away the one that doesn't compile. Uh, then you get an amb if, if both are valid expressions, then you'll get an ambiguity error and you have to be more explicit. Yeah. Okay. Cool, moving on. And like I said, uh, you can pass in extra data like a std map that will get filled in for you. All right, so here's the whole thing. This thing can be used both as a grammar to match valid expressions and as an action which fills in a std map. Okay, it looks like this. You can assert that an expression matches our grammar and then you can call it with an expression and some data. So here's where we pass in the second argument. This is the std map to fill in. Okay? And after you're done, you can check that, yeah, I actually filled in my map correctly. Okay? Cool? All right. Now, let's look again at our initial example. You know, in boost assign, you take this expression, you initialize a std map with it directly. Okay. So what, what must be true of this expression if that line compiles? Evaluate to a map. It must evaluate to a map or? Or convert to a map. Right. So it can't really evaluate to a map, and here's why. Because if this is a, is, if this is a std map, then, well, this has to be a std map, and std map doesn't have a function call operator on it. So this expression has to be something that is convertible to a std map. Well, how do we do that? Proto expression, proto expert, that type, doesn't have a conversion operator to std map. So we write our own expression types. Proto makes this pretty simple. So we're going to be parameterized on expression descriptor. That's going to be one of those function types that describes an expression. Here's our map list of expression type. And now we just inherit from proto expert using CRTP. Okay. And now, who knows what this is? Very exciting. This is an inheriting constructor. Woohoo! Yeah. Client got this about a month ago and I like hardly slept. I was so excited. Finally, <laughs> finally I could replace all of my ugly macros um, that were generating all of these like bajillions of constructor calls. So yeah, uh, this is an inheriting constructor. So just pull all the constructors out of Proto Expert and dump them into my class. Very, very nice, cool feature. I like it a lot. And then we write our conversion operator to std map. What's it going to do in here? Whoops. Well, in here, we're just going to call our map list of transform. That's it. Pretty cool. All right. So, oh. We're essentially done. The only thing we need to do is change the type of our map list of terminal to be one of our expressions as opposed to one of Proto's expressions. Okay. And Proto is smart enough to realize that when you create a new map list of expression, instead of building Proto expressions, it's going to build more of your expression types. Okay. Now, Every time we call one of these function call operators, it's using the one that's pulled out of here. Is the, the copy divided by the compiler, or is that actually the move? The copy. Um, so the question is, is the copy elided by the compiler, or is it a move? 
Move semantics, since we're returning by value and we're returning a local uh, variable, that's automatically a move. Yeah? Unless copulation kicks in, so it's not even a move. Right, Alistair's point is that unless copulation points in and it's not even a move. So that will incur no extra dynamic allocation cost. Um, so if, if that assert fails, what, uh, what are you going to get? Um, I have to check my code. It's, it, it evaluates to a static assert, and I don't remember what the text of the static assert is. Um, this is trivial to implement on your own. It's just a, a static assert and a decal type and a proto matches invocation. So if you want custom uh, failure message here, uh, it's easy to write that yourself using static assert directly. All right, any questions? All right, we've blown through this really quick. Awesome. All right, so back to our problem here with promiscuous operators. This still compiles. Well, we haven't told Proto which operators are valid and which are not. Okay, so what do we do about that? That's well, simple. We just tell Proto, hey, use the map list of grammar, and it will sphene out any operator overload that builds an expression that doesn't match this grammar. So what is Proto domain? Domains are kind of an advanced feature where you get to specify all kinds of things about expressions in your domain, like how to capture children and how to capture terminals and how to build new expressions in your domain. Um, we don't, we're, not, we're not interested in specifying any of that stuff. So you just say, all right, uh, build a domain for me uh, and use the map list of grammar. Yeah, question. So the question is, what's the placeholder for? Um, I might change this, actually. Uh, I'm, really, uh, I'm not 100% sure that you're going to need it. Um, but you can define your own proto domain, give it a name, and then this would be like a CRTP parameter. So if you said like struct my domain colon domain, then you would put here my domain, the name of the derived domain type, which is useful for some things, but it might not need to be the first parameter, so might not I, I might leave that off. Good question. What output will you get? Um, thanks. Uh, this is output from uh, Clang. Error, invalid operands to binary expression, and kind of an ugly expression type. But it points you directly to the operator that failed to compile. Like, I, I couldn't find uh, an overload that made this work. Okay, yeah, Joel. Right. Yeah, okay. So uh, Joel's point is, like an, another way of solving this problem is, well, you know, instead of specifying a, a grammar here and sphenaing out all the operators that you're not interested in, what you could do instead is just let all the operators be there, but the ones that are invalid uh, you can, spec you can uh, write like a static assert in the body of that function so that if it ever gets called, you say like, look, uh, I know uh, what you're trying to do, but uh, it's totally invalid in this domain. Sorry. Which might be a better uh, error message than this. I don't really know. To taste. Yeah. Yeah. It would require you to write, it, write more code. This is nice and short, and it works. Could, could you just have a special domain which has all operators predefined, but with a static assert in them, and let the user kind of specify the ah. operators which are needed so that you don't have to supply those static 
Hmm. That's an interesting suggestion. So uh, the suggestion was, um, could Proto provide a set of overloaded operators for you uh, that it uses, right? And you can opt into those. Uh, I would have to think about how that would be implemented. Probably, it's its own domain. It's, it's its own domain yeah, but you would want to be defining your own domain, and then you might want to be a subdomain of that domain. So Proto does allow uh, super and subdomains. Um, where you can inherit stuff from your domain and your expressions get are compatible with expressions from some other domain. Yeah. Right, so the point is, um, this way of doing it, the compiler points like right at the buggy code, which is nice, yeah. I agree, yeah. The, the other reason why you might want to, to uh, sphene out the operators that you're not interested in is uh, so that, well, it's just really nice in C++ when you can put an expression in a decal type in a function signature, and if that, code doesn't compile, that function gets phenate out entirely. So it's, it's not a hard error. Right. I'm not explaining this very well. Sphenate for expressions is awesome. Um, and if you do it this way, you get it. And if you do it the other way, you don't. Sorry. Yeah, yeah Hartman. Ah, and, and I'm so excited that you brought that up because that's uh, one of the things I'm going to be talking about in the second half of my talk. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's how that's to that's improve that's these horrible compiler error messages. Yeah, yeah. and Sphene, for, Sphene is one of them. Yeah, well, that's, that's the big one. Well, that thing is there. Yeah, it's there. Like, how come it's not being called? Right. Exactly. It's just yeah. Or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So... This is our entire solution. This is map list of the whole thing, the entire library in 26 lines of code. Who thinks that's cool? I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> so how many lines of proto? Actually, I haven't counted the lines of proto, but I will tell you that it is a tiny fraction of what it was in C++ 98. Like the old version of proto is about a 10 times, literally 10 times more code than what uh, is in the rewrite using C++ 11. So it helps compile times. Yes, and it does help compile times too. Yeah, Question? Yeah, no, it, 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 I haven't measured compile times, but uh, my sense, subjective sense, is that uh, it compiles uh, significantly faster. And I haven't done any uh, template profiling or tweaking uh, for compile times at all. So. Just, just for information, the proof text says that Proto doesn't compile in 6,000 lines. 6,000 lines of code. Yeah. Cool. Um, can you do a, a quick check on the old version of Proto? Yeah. Dave? Any idea how long you can make that last, that map plan? I mean, how many parameters you can put before you're going to run out of, yeah, hose the compiler or run out of, yeah, I have no idea. So the question is, like, how big can these expression trees really get? Um, and certainly compile time becomes a concern as these expressions get larger and larger. Uh, I, I haven't measured. I don't know how many levels uh, the tree, uh, how deep you can go. Um, but I imagine that with a, a compiler like Clang, it would probably be pretty deep before you start running into uh, compile time issues. Joel. Okay, so, so Joel's point is that um, just the like type info, the strings from type info 
are, are what's going to really bite you. So 20, 25, uh, so an expression with 25 operators in it. 25 different operators. Different operators in it. So memorization will be typing, so we have a plus, 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 so uh, the, the observation, like uh, symbols, uh, can, can be pretty humongous and uh, 300,000. That boggles my mind. Uh. All right. Yeah. Mm, okay. So th the question is, how does this interact with uh, auto and, and type deduction? So when I create an expression like this, uh, it's a temporary object. Um, <clears throat> what happens when I assign one to auto? Uh, the answer is, in, uh, in the old version of Proto, you would crash and burn. Beca yeah, I know. Well, auto didn't exist. Uh, you know, okay. Uh, but in the new version of Proto, that's perfectly safe. So it automatically detects R values and captures them by value, actually by move. And uh, for L values, they are held by reference. So for instance, this guy, since it's an L value, will always be held by reference in the tree that you're building. But everything else, the ones and twos and threes, including uh, the temporary nodes that are created as you go along, are going to be held by value. Do I use the reference the reference qualifier everywhere? Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, do I use uh, R value references on this? That is like a member function that only works for ref ref. I do use them. And no, GCC, last I checked, doesn't handle that. It's in trunk, because it's not out yet. Okay. Alistair assures me it's coming soon. <laughs> it's right between client three three and GCC four eight one. They're both languages. But actually, I think that you insert something into this list that's not convertible to an explicitly error message that you get. Will it point out that specific job? It will. So if you, if you Try to, like, if you put like a string here, all right, and you assign it to a std map int int, um, you will get an error, and it will happen in that map insert function object that we defined, because that expression will fail to compile. Uh, and you will probably get a template instantiation backtrace at that point. Sorry. Yeah. No, I didn't mean to imply that. I'm sorry. Did I, uh, so the point is that uh, if, you, if you assign this to uh, an auto variable, will you get a std map? And the answer is no, you won't. You'll get some intermediate you know, node type. No. But you could then assign that to a std map and call find on that. And we create multiple maps from the same visualization sequence. Exactly. So the question is, uh, you're uh, asking about the grammar in particular? Well, let's say, let me put it in the text. So instead of having map next to the we have auto next to the And let's assign the map like way later on. Um, and we want to make sure that if we do have a string as a second parameter in the middle of there, that we get the error at that line of code where it's actually being done as opposed to where next is being used someplace later on. I'm wondering if that's a fundamental limitation 
Okay, uh, so the question is, um, so if you were to assign this to a, an auto, and it turned out to be not, an, not a valid uh, map list of expression uh, because uh, one of the terminal types is wrong. Um, could you get an error there instead of later on? And it would actually be pretty difficult to detect, and it's not any uh, shortcoming in the C++ language. It's, uh, you would need to catch it in your DSL, in your domain, in the, in the grammar of the domain. And you could do it, but it would be kind of ugly. Yeah, Joel's nodding his head. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so the fundamental problem here is, okay, it's a compiler construction toolkit. Uh, languages have type systems, but Proto doesn't have any real support for enforcing a type system on expressions like this. That's what I would, yeah. Uh, this, this will uh, create a map and return it, and this is going to be an implicit move. Okay. So that gets moved into that map, and there's no extra dynamic allocation. So how many children do we have? And you can have any number of children that you want. So, zero, two, oh, uh, the, uh, so the question here is, so, okay, how high does this go? Okay, well, I, I only have 10 of these guys, but this is uh, actually a template. So you can say child 50,000 if you want to get the 50,000th child. So actually, I didn't even think of uh, using initializer uh, lists for doing this uh, until like a few days ago, and I haven't had a chance to investigate. Like, I don't even know. Can you initialize a std map with an initializer? You can. Yeah, it's okay. yeah really. That's cool. Okay. I mean, it doesn't invalidate proto at all. Yeah. <laughs> There's particular examples. So just forget about this. This is, yeah. I mean, the, the example's great. It's just not yeah. going to be as something that you actually use. Right. Exactly, yeah. Proto is fun and sometimes useful. Yeah. <laughs> I read a great quote by Richard Feynman. Physics is like sex. Yeah, sometimes it has you know, uh, useful results, but that's not why we do it. <laughs> what? So, so you're, are you asking about uh, doing the, the grammar that does the type checking? Uh, I'm going to hold off on that because we're getting kind of far afield now. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. When it's ready? What's the time frame? Yeah, when, it, when it's ready. I've been working on it for eight months. Um, it's almost there. Almost. Now you're just waiting on the compiler. Yeah. It's not in trunk. So uh, there's a, I'll, I'll, set, I'll post the, the uh, link to the GitHub repo at the end. Okay. So even for small problems, it's useful. Uh, your code is short, declarative, inefficient. Terrific. Okay. Now we're going to be talking about uh, C++11 and how it affected the design of the library and how I think it can improve and address real problems uh, that have been cropping up in library design forever. So, just uh, briefly, this is a complete list of all of the C++11 features that are used by Proto, which is almost all of them. 
Of course, our value references and our value references for this, because that's super important. Uh, variadic templates, et cetera, et cetera. You can go on for, this is an important one, Sphene for expressions. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about a few of these and the problems that they address, in my opinion. Sphene for expressions, for better errors. Generalized constant expressions and standard layout types for static initialization. And inline namespaces for library versioning. So I'll talk first about library versioning because it's short and simple uh, and I'll tip my hand. My goal is to uh, slip Proto V5 into a boost release without anybody knowing um, except you guys and the world because they're watching uh, alongside Proto V4 uh, and make it so that you can use both Proto V4 and V5 side by side even in the same source code. And that's a real challenge, but we can get there using inline namespaces. Um, and it's a pretty neat feature. So basically it's kind of like a inline namespace is like a, a namespace with a using a sequence of using declaration directives where you import all of that stuff into the surrounding namespace. With the exception that it's totally uh, transparent to the user whether the inline namespace exists or not. Uh, by what I mean by that is that um, you could even specialize templates. So imagine that proto inline is inline. Yeah? So say you have a template in here and you want the user to specialize it. Okay. Do they have to open the inline namespace in order to specialize that template? No, you don't. With inline namespaces, you do not need to reach into the inline namespace in order to specialize a template. And that's really the key feature of inline namespaces. It's why it makes library versioning so nice. So I say, in Proto v4, if we have inline namespaces, put the entire implementation of Proto v4 in an inline namespace. That's not going to break code, because if people are specializing templates in the Proto namespace, that's going to still work because this is an inline namespace. Okay. Otherwise, you know, if, if you don't have inline namespaces, then I assume that you're not going to be using Proto V5 alongside it, and it's, the point is moved. Okay. And in Proto V5, uh, use inline namespaces, but let the user toggle which version he's interested in. So if the com if the user compiles with Use Proto V5 by default, then all of Proto V5 gets imported automatically into the Proto namespace, and you have to specify Proto V4 if you want to be backwards compatible. Alistair. Just a minor typo. Uh, if just was reading the slides, on the Proto V4, it should be hack it. On the second line, not hack it there. Oh, on, the, on which line? The second line. Oh, if. If Proto V4 equal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I'll fix that before I get the slides posted. Okay? So it's just one of those little features that C11 has added that really makes the life of a, a library developer much simpler because now I don't have to worry so much about breaking backwards compatibility. I'll just put everything in a new inline namespace and be done with it. Alistair. No. Yeah, so uh, the question is, um, is it all implemented in the same headers? And the answer is no. I think what I'm going to do is just put all of Proto V5 in a separate subdirectory. So if you want Proto V5, you have to reach into the V5 directory uh, and ask for that version of Proto. I haven't decided on that yet. So the, the observation is, well, that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, it doesn't because other libraries that you may be using in the same source file might be using Proto V4. I'm not sure if I am following your logic. I might 
talk to you afterwards, uh, yeah, just to understand your concern. Yeah. So, in other words, you're kind of saying the default should be four forever, right? If you don't specify the version, that's what you get. So, if you don't specify the version, you're going to get v4. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think that's a good default for now, because uh, not everybody builds Clang from trunk. <laughs> you should. I agree. It's <laughs> terrific, um, but I, I think people are going to be using v4 for a very long time. You know, and you, you should have to opt in if you want V5 because it's not going to work for very many people. You could always define proto latest and see if you set proto for equal proto latest and then you could advance as new versions come out and that, in that same way opt to go past the report to be version 4. So I could uh, just uh, give people the option of saying give me the latest version. Um, you definitely need to code against something, and chances are you know what that something is. So it's useful to specify an exact type, and it's probably not that useful to just say, give me the latest. I might, might not be prepared for the latest. Yeah. I should say that this is really good, probably only good, for interface breaking changes. That's why you want the versioning. Okay. So next. Static initialization in Proto. Why is static initialization important? Does anybody know? Why do we care about like global variables and their initialization? The initialization order problem. Yes. So that's exactly the problem. So if, if people aren't familiar with the initialization order problem, say you've got a bunch of uh, global objects and they have constructors that run at startup time. One object might depend on the initialization of another object and that object might indirectly depend on the initialization of the first object, which means that it's possible to use an object before it's constructed. Um, and that's bad and I've had to debug crashes uh, and it's not at all obvious what's going on, trust me. So you really, really want to make all of your global objects const expert. So we've already seen that uh, proto expert, you can initialize it const expert. And you can also const expert initialize your, your own expression types. And that's pretty cool. That means, you know, the terminals in our domain specific languages, we don't have to worry about them. But, you can also initialize arbitrary expressions, calling overloaded operators, capturing variables, all at const expr. C++ 11 is freaking awesome. So yeah. So, Alistair, if you want to take this guy and use it to initialize a whole bunch of maps all the same way, sure, you can do this in a header file. Very cool. But wait. <laughs> so, say you've got one of these const expert expression types. You can define an algorithm. Seriously. So, say, say for whatever reason, for, you know, whatever's in giggles, uh, you want to, you know, multiply, you don't want to square every integer in here. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it's, you know, it's fun. So you write a little algorithm. So everywhere you see a, an integer terminal, multiply it by itself. Create a new terminal that multiplies. You, th you think what? I think you just broke the oh yeah, Joel. Joel, you're broken. <laughs> I 
only got this working a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, this is really neat. I don't know what it's useful for, but <laughs> it's really neat. Yeah, Const Expert is pretty awesome. I, I think it's a great feature. Marshall. I just wanted to comment since you're already building client control. Yes. What do I get then? You get a much bigger bag of tricks for context. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you get variables and you get fours and wilds. Oh, okay. So if I flip another switch, I get more toys to play with. You can you can mutate const expert values. Oh, okay, okay. So, so the, the point is like in a const expert function, you can declare variables, mutate them, and then return a value. And it, oh, that blows my mind. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You can also, I think the, the main problem is that you can, currently const expert implies that the function on that literal or on that class is constant. But now they have it so that it doesn't imply constant. Yeah, constant. yeah. Therefore, you can take a, a static way Assign it one, then change the value to two. Mm. Okay. Or, you know, call it on okay. So the point is, if you have a const expert member function, that member function is automatically a const member function, as in, like it implies the this parameter is const, but apparently that's not necessarily true anymore, which is good because I hate that. Okay. <laughs> good. Okay. So I'm happy anytime I can break Joel's brain. Okay, so here's, here's the important one and the one that Hartman might be interested in. Um, we want template error messages to be better. Better, I don't know. What do we mean by this? Shorter, more readable, and um, we definitely want to keep Proto's privates private. Okay. Instead of like, exposing all of compiler, uh, Proto's um, internal implementation details to the user and accosting them with it. Okay, so the problem is Sfine for experts. What do I mean? Let's define a macro called return. And it uses the trailing return type with decal type, var, var args, this is a variadic macro, and it returns that thing. Who's, who's written a macro like this? It's kind of useful. Yeah, a couple of people. Okay, what can you do with it? So say you define a function, you say auto, some function, and then return an expression. I never have to say what the return type is at all. This just works. You know, I could define all my functions like this. In fact, Proto does. So here we have one function object and another function object that calls the first by passing along its argument and a, and a third function object, et cetera, right? And now I call S2, which is this guy, with a string. So it's gonna pass this guy through here, which passes it through to here, which tries to add one to a stood string. Alistair. Because it wouldn't fit on the slide. Yeah, so the question was, how come uh, no accept isn't here? I just left it off because the macro that I use in Proto does. Everything uh, deduces no except also. Okay, what do you think is going to happen when we do this? Well, it's not going to compile, right? Because you can't add one to a std string. What's the error message going to be? You expect it to be something like really horrible, right? Yes. 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 Okay. So, so here is the problem, and it's an enormous problem. So this is the error message you get. No matching function for call to object of type S2. That is it. Right? I couldn't call this guy. No candidate, temp uh, candidate template ignored. Like, hey, I tried to call this one, but it didn't work. Great. So you're going to give code to the compiler. The compiler's going to look at it for a bit and say, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So it doesn't tell you, notice this error message doesn't say anything about S0. It says it's a substitution failure, yes, but it doesn't tell you where the failure is. Okay, the failure is here in S0. This tells you nothing about S0. It doesn't tell you where to look. That's the entire error message. It's not like I've trimmed it. That's the whole thing. Problem. So imagine, like, I've implemented Proto. Proto is implement implemented entirely using this. Recursive functions that call recursive functions, the stack is maybe 100 calls deep. You call into it, the compiler shrugs and says no. <laughs> so you've got to figure out where in that 100 call deep function stack my error is. Oh, that's not going to work at all. Okay, so let's fix it. Let's define try call, which is a function object wrapper, which does perfect forwarding. It either forwards all the arguments to an invocation of the function, or it returns some special type called substitution failure. Okay. If this expression fails to compile, this guy disappears, Sphene, gone. And this one gets selected, and we return substitution failure, and it has the signature of the function that failed to compile. Okay, this one only gets selected when this fails to compile, because this one's volatile and that one's not. Okay, you guys with me so far? All right. You just threw up a little bit in your mouth? Yeah? Yeah, all right. But this is awesome. <laughs> so here's, here's substitution failure. Uh, it's got a virtual function called what? What? That, well, it's this exact same expression here. Okay. The expression that failed to compile here is here. Well, what's up with that? We're going to get the same error, right? So here's what happens. If we wrap everything in try call, then here's the error message. No matching function call for object of type S0. Uh, S0. Ah, we got it. S0. Okay. Here's the thing that failed to compile, right? An instantiation of member function substitution, right, of what? Instantiated from here. Ah, this was my call. Okay. Candidate template ignored. Substitution failure. Look, I can't add a string and an int. And it tells me exactly where. And that's the entire error message. There's nothing trimmed. That's the whole thing. One error. Joel. <laughs> It's pretty great. It's a total hack. Okay. Um, and so the, the downside of this thing is that you have to write all of your functions using this return macro and try call. You can't have a function that's more than one line long. <laughs> Good functions, only one line long. Yeah. Um, so who's going to ask me how this works? I am too. <laughs> I have no idea how this works. Yeah. So somebody, I think it was Doug Greger, supposed that um, he's, he just supposed that uh, this, uh, I can't remember now. What's that? Try call. Can you read that back there? It always has to be instantiated because it's a virtual function, yes. But the, I think what Doug said was that processing of actual um, generating code from the virtuals is only done at the end of the translation unit. And at that point, like this enormous 
uh, template instantiation backtrace has been lost. So you only get this error instead of like all the rest. It's kind of like, it's kind of like throwing the substitution failure, catching it, and then reporting it later. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I, I have erased the instantiation backtrace. Yeah. And I did. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many, how deep, it only reports, like, this is what failed, this is where you called it from. It's perfect. It works in GCC. It, it most certainly does not work in Visual Studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, the error messages that you get from the new version of Proto are, are breathtakingly beautiful. It's really great. Okay, that's really the end of my talk. I finished 15 minutes early, so we got tons of time. Um, I really thought I was going to be running short of time, so I hurried. I'm really sorry. If you guys have any more questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them now. Dave. On that long list of features you had at the beginning of the yeah. discussion, we talked about the benefits of having a single source of truth. Yeah. How much of that hits your performance benefit? Which features out of that really will make a difference? So the question is, uh, which of these features will help with performance? Um, so, so, okay, that's two, uh, two different things. There's compile time performance and then there's runtime performance. And I don't think, well, okay, runtime performance, our value references and move semantics are going to be a big win. Um, that's where you save uh, in, you know, uh, all the copies, especially in uh, an expression template library like Proto. I had to make design compromises in the, in the original version of Proto to capture temporaries by reference even though I knew it was unsafe because of performance reasons. Now I don't have to make that compromise because I have move semantics, so I can do the safe thing and it's fast, uh, which is terrific. Uh, compile time, I haven't done extensive compile time benchmarking, but I am, I'm guessing that it's going to be uh, a huge win to have variadic templates. Um, not so much variadic class templates, um, but variadic function templates. Because uh, what, what we had to do before was generate function overloads using the preprocessor. And that's dog slow. And then you end up with, I don't know, 10, 16, 20, 50 overloads of the exact same function just to handle different numbers of arguments. All gone. All gone. Return type deduction for normal functions. Actually, Alistair was explaining to me why uh, I won't be able to use that feature and why most of you won't be able to use that feature. It's really uh, very sad. Yeah, okay. So, so the problem, and remind me. That's terrible. Why can't it just be a, a rewrite? Yeah. So it's it's tragic and sad. Um, I would I would love uh, to be able to use that feature uh, because my code is littered with that return macro. And I would love to uh, just replace, like, I, I want macros to die entirely. Um, but sadly, that's not going to happen. And you're killing me for the no accept anyway. And the other uh, issue that uh, uh, Alistair says is when you use uh, 
uh, that sort of like type deduction on normal functions that you don't get the no except clause, which is a bummer also. All right, Hartman. Really? Okay, so maybe maybe const expr is actually going to improve compile times for you know if you have a lot of global variables. No, run oh, runtime. Startup, startup time. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Startup time. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's um you know that's well it's const expression. Yeah. Yeah, that, that code has been executed at compile time already and it's just blasted in there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Dave? Whatever it was, 300,000 character variable name blows my mind. Is there any way to shorten up the variable names and cut that in half or something? Uh, so, so is there any way... Is there any way to, to shorten up those names? Um, I, I really don't know of a, a good way of doing that. Um, you know, maybe define everything in, you know, some namespace like PT, uh, you know, and then import everything into the boost proto v5 namespace, um, which would be awful. Uh, I, I, I don't want to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know of any uh, good solution to that problem. It's it's a real problem. Alistair. Extend the hook to the implementation of the using some kind of compression on the template names, because otherwise, yeah, those names get huge. Yeah. yeah. But these kinds of names do, they, they kind of zip well because they're recursive instantiations of the same thing, but they've got a, a compressed mangling. They, they tend to compress very well. Yeah, so Alistair's point is, you know, if, if your compiler is good, it can make that a lot smaller for you using compression. Um, will, you, will the type will the type information where those strings show up if you're statically linking? Yeah, I think they will. I mean, you can you can call type ID on a type that's exported from a from a library and then get the name called dot name, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sebastian. Right, right. So, so apparently the, um, the name mangling in GCC uh, doesn't do the kind of uh, compression that I would need for this. Right. Um, boy, that was that was pretty far back. Uh, so, um, let's see if I can find it. How do I? Oh, I see. Oh. Is it this one? Yeah, this. Okay. So yeah, uh, this second parameter uh, when you're evaluating algorithms. Uh, is kind of like a, um, it's like a key value store. You can uh, have as many keys and values in this. This creates an object that remembers that the data parameter was initialized with a std map. You can define as many of these as you want and build up some like large key value pair store and use that in your algorithms. So you get more than just one data parameter, essentially. I found it useful in some situations. 
All right. So uh, let me skip back to the last slide where uh, you can find the uh, GitHub URL. All right. So uh, it's, it's just about ready uh, for people to start beating on it. And I would really love uh, for some users. Um, I think Joel is going to be jumping on it, um, which is great. Send me bug reports. Tell me, tell me what you want to do that it doesn't do. Um, yeah, any feedback would be great. Um, thanks. Yeah. You have a question, Michael? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you want to, so, so say you have like, um, like an integer and you want to turn it into a proto expression so that you can build trees with it, you can just say underscore one ET for expression template. And that's a proto terminal that stores an integer, actually an unsigned long, long. And then you could say this plus 42. And this is actually a, a tree node, a plus node. Yeah. Uh, what about the uh, Windows environment? Uh, that's, that's this. Oh. ET. ET is the user defined suffix. Yeah. I mean, if you have, if you have a better suggestion for the suffix, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, standard layout types. Yeah, let's. I I have some hidden slides on that. Okay. Standard layout types. Um, literal class types are a subset of standard layout types. It's basically the C++ equivalent of pod. So if you know what pod is, it's plain old data. It's stuff that can be statically initialized. But in C++ 11, it's a much larger class of objects than just pods. Okay. So here's the rules. Uh, it has trivial copy, move constructors, and destructors. Oh, literal class. Yeah, thanks. At least one const expert constructor that isn't the copy or move one. And all bases and members are also uh, literal class types. Um, and I'm interested in literal class types because they're statically initializable and they're user defined classes. So proto expert is a literal class type. And uh, here's, here's a little example. So you can have a struct B with a const expert constructor. Um, base classes are OK. This is still a literal class type. Uh, Non-trivial constructors are OK, right? Trivial means like we've supplied, I've supplied the body. I didn't let the compiler generate it for me. Access control is fine. Data members are fine. And here, this is a, a user-defined literal, okay? Uh, and it's, you know, const expert, good. I can return one of these guys from a, a literal function, a string literal function. I, I still get static initialization. So this, this is what I mean by uh, literal class types, and literal class types are a subset of standard layout types. Oh, is it the other way around? Oh, okay. So the requirements there are simply that no more than one class in the hierarchy actually has data members. Mm -hmm. And all those data members are under a single access specifier. Okay. And all those data members are in turn standard layout types. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to repeat that, but I defer to Alistair, and if you want that, go talk to him. So yeah, or open up the standard. standard. Of pod so that you can do ABI compatibility. Oh, okay. Standard layout types for ABI compatibility. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in step. The static initialization. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the question has to do with um, Proto actually sort of lets you overload operator dot in a very strange roundabout sort of way. Um, by giving classes uh, members that 
when you access them, look like they're the right-hand side of an expression um, consisting of a member access operator. Um, no, uh, there isn't any better solution because C++11 doesn't overload operator dot, but uh, Sebastian's going to be giving a talk on that later in the week. So go to Sebastian's talk. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>